Aloha ahiahi e koma mai. My name is Nicole Weimer, but many of you know me as Hono. And I'm originally from Hawaii on the island of Oahu. And I'm currently a master's student at the University of Tartu. And I first like to thank Kadi Hammer, who's unfortunately not here with us, for organizing the lecture series, as well as Professor Ulo Volk for honoring me with an invitation to speak on my home state. So I'll be speaking about Pele, the volcano goddess of Hawaii, and her presence in modern day, in case you had wondered in the wrong lecture room. <laughs> but before we get to the core of the lecture, I'd like to give a brief overview of the history of ancient Hawaii to the fall of the kingdom, starting with a geographical makeup. So, Hawaii is the most isolated population in the world in regards to the nearest continents. From California, it is 2,467 miles or 3,970 kilometers. From Japan, it is 4,108 miles away or 6,611 kilometers. From here in Tartu, we sit at 7,023 miles away or 11,302 kilometers away just to give a little context. Uh, the Hawaiian Islands, or at least the chain of the islands, sit on the Pacific tectonic plate, and the islands were formed by a volcanic hotspot. And this is a hole within the plate that magma pushes through and creates volcanoes, and therefore, the islands themselves. The plate moves at about five to 10 centimeters northwest per year. The Hawaiian island chain numbers to about 135 to 150 different islands, including atolls, islets, rocks, and coral reefs. However, some of these are excluded from the official count because they're simply too small to constitute as an island due to erosion and bare existence. In the case of the Maro reefs, these are only visible during low tide. <clears throat> the state of Hawaii consists of eight main islands. Seven of them are inhabited and six only publicly. Kaho'olawe, and my cute little red pointer, this little mm -hmm. island right here, <coughs> is, uh, was used as a target bomb practice for the United States military, therefore rendering it inhabitable, uh, inhospitable. Uh, Ni'ihau, way over here, the first and oldest island, is a privately owned island by the Robinson family, where one needs to be invited as a special guest to the island. These eight islands were created uh, with a total of 15 volcanoes. So starting from the youngest island, this is Hawaii, but we also call it Big Island because it's quite big. And it has five volcanoes total, two of which are extinct, two of which are dormant, and one that is currently active, which is Kilauea. Maui, the Valley Isle, and that would be here, kind of looks like a woman on the side, has three extinct volcanoes, Kaho Olave has one. Lanai is right here. It is also one extinct volcano. Moloka'i, the Shu, uh, has two extinct volcanoes, as does Oahu. Kauai has one, and so does Ni'ihau. And so a lot of people will know where Oahu is. Well, maybe not Oahu per se, but Honolulu and Waikiki. And that would be located here. This is Honolulu and then Waikiki is somewhere on the side. It wasn't important to be added, apparently. Uh, so, <clears throat> we will begin our journey with a little bit of context of the history before we get into the core of our lecture. <coughs> so we'll start at 940 AD. And the first settlers to Hawaii were guesstimated to be between 940 to 1130 AD and believed to be from the Marquesas Islands. And the final wave of uh, migrants came from Tahiti who were expert star navigators. They utilized numerous skills passed down through oral, oral knowledge that depended on understanding on how to read the environment. This includes, but is not limited to, the patterns of the wind, the rising and setting sun movements, constellation and important star markers, the formation of clouds, the myriad of waves and ocean currents, to the types of birds and weather patterns. They traveled in double-hulled canoes, as you can see here in this photo, and brought with them taro, breadfruit, sweet potato, kukui, dogs, chickens, pigs, and much more. With their arrival, they began to build a new society, building upon their previous foundations of religion, social political structure, and culture. 600 years will pass with no intervention outside of the Polynesian world. 
So we'll fast forward a little bit into 1779 with the first actual documented arrival of the uh, white westerner from Britain known as Captain James Cook. He luckily <coughs> reached the shores of Hawaii during the Makahiki Festival, which is a Hawaiian New Year festival that celebrates agriculture and the music god Lono. It's a festival that focuses on rest, enormous feasts, and a time where work was actually forbidden. Captain Cook was believed to be the embodiment of Lono himself and was thus treated quite lavishly by the locals. After spending some time there, Captain Cook and his crew were well stocked up and departed Kealo Kekua Bay on February 4th, 1779. Unfortunately, he headed straight into a terrible sea storm that damaged his ships and forced him to turn back and return to the islands. So it's said that the local people were appalled at the audacity of a simple human impersonating such a sacred god, which led to the murder of Captain Cook. But really what had happened historically is that there was a battle that broke out between the indigenous people and Captain Cook and his crew. Uh, Captain Cook kidnapped a local chief in response to finding that some supplies were stolen off his ships. Basically nails were taken. So thus Captain Cook's fortune of discovering Hawaii became unfortunate <clears throat> and he met his demise on the shores of Kealakekua Bay on the Big Island on Valentine's Day, February 14th, 1779, when he was stabbed to death. So another important historical figure within the history of Hawaii is King Kamehameha I. Uh, he was destined to be the greatest and he would be laced with myth, legends, and epics. He was born in 1758, along with a prophecy that foretold his birth. The prophecy comes in three components. The first, saying that the killer of chiefs, because each island had local chiefs, would be born the night that a light in the sky with feathers like a bird would streak across the night sky, much like the Star of David foretelling the birth of Jesus. Historians mark the year of Kamehameha's birth with the sighting of Haley's Comet over Hawaii. The child will also be Po'olua, which means a child of two fathers. This turned out to be true because King Kamehameha's mother had an affair with another local chief, but was raised by her first husband. And the last of the prophecy was that the killer of chiefs would possess great strength, enough to move the Naha stone, which weighs over two tons. Legend tells us that Kamehameha was able to roll the stone over in his youth. He began his epic campaign to unite all the eight islands under one chief ruler in the year of 1782. And he was a formidable opponent to the local chiefs as well as a master military strategist because he was mentored by one of the most famous and talented warriors of all Hawaii at the time. Keku Haupi'io was also an important historical figure as he kept Kamehameha as a baby hidden and safe from all the other local chiefs attempts to assassinate the baby to prevent the fulfillment of the prophecy. But Kamehameha lived to make his way from the big island to Maui, winning nearly every battle he sought and fought. The last and most decisive battle that Kamehameha fought was the Battle of Nu'uwanu, as you can see from this gory image. What he had done was he cornered the legion of the opposers against the Pali Cliff and pushed them to their death. In 1940, when the highway was being built beneath the Pali uh, Cliff, they found, they unearthed 800 skulls. King Kamehameha would rule until his death in 1810, only nine years after the end of his war campaign. He was a man who possessed powerful mana, which is a divine spiritual power and strength. And the Hawaiians believed that the bones possessed magical properties in which that mana could be benefited to the, the person that possesses the bones. So upon King Kamehameha's death, his body was ceremoniously prepared for the next life, which included the removal of his flesh from his bones. The magical bones were entrusted to two people only, to hide in a secret place. Different stories circulate to this day, especially when the tale is told to children of how and where the bones are speculated to be. I remember being a little girl being told this tale and that the great king's bones were buried in a cave on a moonless night during the low tide. The bones supposedly rest in this cave to this day as it remains hidden during the high tide and that the two trusted people that buried his bones committed suicide to prevent disclosing the secret of the king's powerful bones. 
Kamehameha's dynasty will come to a close in 1874 with the death of King Luna Lilo Kamehameha VIII, who had left no children behind. Thus, His Royal Highness King David Kalakaua would succeed to the throne. So we have Kalakaua here and Lili Ogolani, who is Kalakaua's sister. So I'll briefly summarize some key historical uh, points here. During Kalakaua's reign, American businessmen came and settled in Hawaii, which then led to the eventual fall of the Hawaiian Kingdom. The bayonet constitution drafted by American businessmen stripped the monarchy of its power, and the Royal Hawaiians fought to reclaim it, conscripting support from different kingdoms such as the British Empire, whom they had close relations with. Kalakaua passed away in San Francisco, San Francisco on his journey back home to Hawaii. His sister Lili Okalani took the throne on January 29, 1891. Political events quickened and she was soon overthrown by five businessmen known as the Big Five. Castle and Cook, Alexander and Baldwin, Brewer and Company, American Factors, and Theo H. Davies and Company, all companies that exist to this day. This force overtake was led by Sanford B. Dole himself, who is known as the owner of Dole Pineapple Plantation that we eat today. Thus, the Kingdom of Hawaii became the Republic of Hawaii. Queen Liliokalani contested their legal overthrow by seeking support and retribution by petitioning to the President of the United States, who was Grover Cleveland at the time. Cleveland, at first, opposed the illegal annexation and initiated an investigation. However, as Americans do, we go to war quite often. So uh, we entered the Spanish-American War, and Hawaii presented to be an asset in war efforts, and thus was annexed. Hawaii became a treaty of the United States in 1900, and became a state in 1959. Finally, to wrap up this quick historical overview, former President Bill Clinton signed the Apology Resolution on November 23, 1993 recognizing and apologizing for the illegal overthrow of the kingdom and subsequent annexation 102 years after the fact. But I'd like to redirect us into ancient Hawaii, less sad political overthrows and so forth. And ancient Hawaii was a orally based culture and society and there are two important components that are vital to contextualizing and understanding this ancient society. First is the kapu system, which is an ancient Hawaiian code of conduct and regulations. Laws, if you will. Kapu means forbidden, but it also means sacred. And if kapu was broken, death was a consequence. Which seems like a severe punishment to uh, those that didn't live in this time, but record details show that it was not used as often as one would believe. Hawaiians generally respected and followed the kapu, as it has supplemented their understanding of themselves, their society, and culture and the environment that they lived in. The kapu system heavily influenced the socio-political framework of the time. It decreed what people could eat, who they could eat with, when certain plants or animals could be harvested or killed, to the demeanor of the presence of an ali'i, which is chief in Hawaiian. Some examples of this is that women and men ate separately. People were not allowed to step in the shadow of an ali'i, since it was believed that you could steal his mana through this manner. Women were restricted from consuming pork, certain types of fish, coconuts, and most varieties of bananas, as these foods were believed to be the corporeal forms of the sacred male gods. In times of war, the first two men that were slain were offered as sacrifices to the gods. And during the summer months, aku, skipjack tuna, could not be fished for. In modern day Hawaii, kapu is defined as restricted. You'll see this a lot on private properties, entering sacred sites of old structures, to even, even simple things such as the photo on the left, which says, do not touch. The kapu system, in conjunction with the agriculturally based society, created and fostered a unique perception and relationship to the land itself. Hawaiians viewed themselves as stewards of the land, subjects to more powerful forces of nature, their gods and goddesses. Their religion was polytheistic, and much like the Greek gods, and goddesses, the Hawaiian deities embodied very human-like qualities. So we have uh, qualities such as jealousy, anger, vindictiveness, ambivalence, and so forth. They were not uh, as benevolent and omnipotent entities as we would like to believe gods to be. 
But unlike the Greek pantheon, there lacks a clear distinction and boundaries of Hawaiian gods and their roles that they play. So here we have the four main gods. And Kane, the second one, was the first god to gain consciousness in Po, which was darkness. And he called to his brothers Ku, the war god, and Lono, the peaceful god, to also wake up. Even though Kane is believed to be the creator god, there are also other deities that aided in the creation of the world, such as Papo, which is Mother Earth, or Vakea, the Sky Father. Kaneloa is the fourth and final main god, and he is a juxtaposition to Kane. It's not as simple as the devil and God in Christianity, because ancient, in ancient Hawaiian religion, there really was no pure evil deity. Kaneloa, therefore, acted as a divine duality to Kane. With up, there is down. With light, there is darkness. And Kaneloa represented balance to Kane. So on this slide, I pulled a very small sample of the many deities that exist in ancient Hawaiian religion. We have Hina, the goddess of moon and healing, Poliahu, the goddess of snow, and yes, we do have snow in Hawaii. Uh, it's on the summit of Mauna Kea, which stands at 4,207 meters above the sea level, making it the tallest mountain except Mount Everest if we're starting from the Earth crust. There's also Maui, the demigod who caught the sun, and is also a time shifter. There's Namaka o Kaha'i, who is a powerful ancient goddess of the sea and water, who also happens to be Pele's older sister. Here I talk about the uniqueness of the roles that deities play and the specificness of it, if we're going to be honest. The number of Hi'iaka sisters varies from folklorist to folklorist, from one historian to the next. There are records showing to be as little as four and as many as 40 sisters. Here we have eight. These are the most commonly known and generally agreed upon uh, between historians and folklorists. Uh, and they're so specific that we have Hi'iaka, the fire-eyed canoe breaker. I'm not quite sure what she does. I really can't tell you, but apparently there's a role needed. At the bottom, uh, we have Hi'iaka Ikapo'oli o Pele, Hi'iaka of the bosom of Pele, who was uh, Pele's younger sister. And Pele brought her in an egg, and Hi'iaka warmed up and incubated from Pele's volcanic heat, let's be honest, hatched from the egg. So we can't forget about Pele, the main star of the show, and she's probably the most well-known goddess to this day in mo uh, modernity both in Hawaii and especially out of Hawaii. She has many names, but the most prominent ones are Pele Honumea, she who shapes the sacred land, Kavahine Ai Honua, the earth devouring woman, more respectfully, Madame Pele, or more lovingly, Tutu Pele, which means Grandmother Pele. So we have uh, the origin story of Pele, and there are different variations to it, orally based society. Of course, there's many. The one uh, that is most recognized and recited is the one where Pele was expelled from her home in Tahiti. So I will play this video, tell you the story, and I will not have the sound on because it's this weird dramatic music. So what had happened was that Pele had seduced her sister's older sister's husband, which of course angered the sister. Namaka Okaha'i therefore chased Pele out, banishing her from the home. Pele saw out a new home and started with the making of the island Ni'ihau, the oldest and one of the smallest islands. She dug her fire staff into the ground and began to make her home with lava. Namaka Okaha'i, seeking vengeance, saw, saw Pele out and found her. Using her powers of the ocean, she drowned out Pele's efforts with massive storms and ocean waves. Pele escaped to the next area where she started to make Oahu, but Namaka Okaha'i not giving up until she had exacted her revenge, extinguished those attempts as well. There was a great battle between the two powerful sisters at Maui where Namaka Okaha'i had destroyed Pele. It is there that Pele died. There is a formation of rocks on the coast of Maui known as Ka'ivi o Pele, the bones of Pele. However, the legend tells that the death of Pele actually released her from her demigod form and was born again into a full-fledged fire volcano goddess. Thus the story goes, till Pele reached Big Island, where she dug her fire staff in so deep and drew upon her newfound powers 
to create a home that would withstand the forces of her sister, Namaka Okahai. And that is why Kilauea still erupts to this day. In Hawaii today, we also don't carry pork over the Pali Highway. And that's because of this legend. This is Kamapua'a. And Kamapua'a is a pig god. He possessed attributes much like the wild boar himself, such as piggish eating habits, mannerisms, and even bristly hair and features of that of a boar. So one day, his boarish eyes met the beauty of Pele, and he was immediately captivated. He pursued her persistently, even though Pele avoided him and tried to flick him off with her powers. But one day, she finally gave in, and they were passionate lovers. But it was short-lived, because both of the gods possess stubborn streaks and fiery tempers. And we all know that doesn't end well for a relationship. So the tumultuous relationship fell apart, and a great war ensued between the two. She fought with fire and lava, while he worked with the water gods to, and drenched her with rainstorms. At a certain point, Kamapua'o believed that Pele was defeated, extinguished by the water forces. But Pele rose up, twice as strong, as she called out to the gods of the underworld to aid her in the fight. She commanded the volcanoes to erupt, and the lava engulfed Kamapua'a. He, however, was able to escape and fled to the edge of the sea, where he transformed into the state fish, Humuhumunukunukuapua'a. <laughs> and it is believed that the fish possesses a tough skin, able to withstand boiling waters. And if you get close enough, not that I've tested it myself, Apparently, the fish also snorts like a pig. So the battle ended when the two came to an agreement. Kamapua'o would retain his rights to the windward side of the island of Oahu, while Pele owns the leeward side. To bring pork over the Pali Highway, which acts as a boundary of the agreement, is symbolic to breaking it. Strange happenings have occurred when pork is brought over. Now, you're probably thinking that this is a simple story to tell children, scare them, you know, stop saying you're hungry, or maybe it's just a superstition, right? Maybe not. Because there was a news article in 2007 when two reporters decided to test this superstition itself. I won't go into all the details, you can find it online. Uh, but one reporter said that he felt a weird shift in the environment, where everything stilled and chills had run down his spine. The pork bun sat in his lap, and he left the pork bun for the experiment on the bench and ran back to his car. But when he turned around to see if the pork bun was still there, it had mysteriously vanished. And he stated in the article that he did not want to investigate further. The greatest enemy to a uh, flower is probably children. We all tell our kids to not pick flowers, right? Uh, in Hawaii, we especially tell children not to pick the ohia lehua blossom. And it's because there was once a handsome warrior named ohia. And Ohia deeply loved this tender, beautiful woman named Lehua. And they were married and passionately in love with each other. And while, uh, one day, while Ohia was working in the forest, who of course comes up, Pele, and she saw him, was captivated by his handsomeness and instantly desired him. She walked over, trying to entice him to lay with her. He kindly but firmly turned her proposition down due to his committed love to Lehua. Pele left by him behind the trees and watch Lehua approach Ohia with his lunch in hand. Jealous of this mortal woman's beauty and of her husband's denial to a goddess like her, Pele stepped out of hiding and her disguise as a mortal woman became a column of fire. She angrily punished Ohia by turning him into a mangled, grotesque tree. Lehua cried out, begging for Pele to return her beloved back, but Pele, satisfied with her revenge, brushed the beautiful mortal off and departed. Lehua cried out to the other gods, begging for them to intervene and turn Ohia back into a human. The gods, however, were unable to do Pele's powerful magic. But to rectify the unjust actions of Pele, they turned Lehua into a blossom and placed her on top of her husband, who is now a tree. Thus, in Hawaii, we believe we are not to pick the Lehua blossom because it will surely bring forth rain. And this is supposedly Lehua crying out from being separated from her husband once again. Now, what is the relationship and interaction with the locals of today and Pele? I will begin with Pele's curse. It's kind of a lot to read, but it's interesting, I promise. 
Thousands of tourists flock to the volcanic national park hoping to see Pele in her full glory. The issue is that people feel entitled to take pieces of her home back with them as trinkets or souvenirs. And of course, this deeply angers Pele. Surely you wouldn't visit someone's home only to take something that doesn't belong to you. So the idea is the same, and on this slide I've pulled from an archive of photos and testimonies of Pele's curse. Volcanic rocks, sand, plants, and other things make their way back from all over the United States, but also from places like Canada, Mexico, and even the Czech Republic. On the right are selected testimonies, such as, I do not know, these are just coincidences, but too many have gone wrong in too short of a time. I'm not usually superstitious, but. And other statements detailing the list of bad luck, misfortunes, and of course, death. Uh, that doesn't normally occur in these people's lives at such a frequent uh, rate. So if you do go to Hawaii, please respect the land, the culture, and please leave things where they actually belong. So here are some aerial photos of the recent eruption in Kilauea uh, last year, 2018, um, where I believe about 300 people had to be evacuated from a region path of the destruction. Uh, here's a short video, and for this one, I will play the beginning sound, at least. Closely, you get Darwin's next victims right there in the cliff. It's kind of intense, scary music. But uh, when the water meets, or when the lava meets the water, uh, formations of usually two types of rocks are made pahoehoe, hoi, which is a soft, um, smooth lava rock, and a uh -uh, which is a uh, sharp sharp rocks that you don't want to step on. So we'll exit out of that. Of course it doesn't want to cooperate with me. Here are more beautiful photos of uh, the power of Pele. Lelania states a community was in the direct path of the lava flow and therefore the members were evacuated and escorted out of the area last year. From an article, a state legislator representing the Puna district on the big island had said that this is part of living in Pele's home. She had lamented about the slow moving disaster will keep many displaced residents in emotional and financial limbo for months. Yet, she had noted when the lava flows come in, Hawaiians clean their houses to welcome Pele. They believe that Pele is coming to visit even if she leaves a path of destruction. In another news article, many locals revere and respect Pele and understand that the wrath of Pele can be destructive, but is part of nature that is not to be disturbed. A former resident of Lani Puna Gardens had said that she's doing what she needs to do, she's cleaning house, and she's just making things right. She's doing what she needs to do for the community. And much like the Mother Mary burnt toast, I hope we get that reference where we see Mother Mary on the toast. No, Google will help you. Uh, we tend to see Pele in uh, her works. On the left side, you can see the formation of what seems to be Pele's hand crawling out. It's kind of creepy. Mm. And on the right, we have a Twitter user comparing the images of the lava flow from last year to the painting of Pele by Herb Conant. So we can have her flowers, actually I have a pointer that is also red, so that doesn't make sense. But we have the flowers here, her face, and her hair. Here, a photographer uh, captured Pele rising out of the ocean waves and what looks like to be wearing a lava, that, uh, a lava cloak cascading down the cliff. So I'm gonna help you guys see it a little bit. Do we see Pele in there? Yep. Yeah, okay, okay, I'll help those that can. I won't call you out. So this is the far away version. 
And this is her hair, her body, oh god, red, and her face. Can I see it? Oh. Moving on. At Halea Ma'uma'u crater, Pele is frequently sighted in the volcanic gas and smoke that is emitted from the crater. The center is a close-up of Pele's side profile, while the far right photo is a infant depiction, which is quite creepy, if you ask me. So parts of Pele's uh, body is also attributed to geological artifacts, such as Pele's hair. Uh, and Pele's hair, which is on the left-hand side, is hair-like strands of volcanic glass that is stretched thin from molten lava as they are launched from the eruption. Pele's hair is mineraloids formed from basalic lava, apologies to geologists out there, and incredibly dangerous to handle as it acts like tiny razor blades of fiberglass. Tiny broken pieces also pose a hazard as they fly around when the wind picks up and if it enters the eye, will probably lead to blindness after pain. Pele's tears are tiny teardrop shaped black volcanic glass, which is similar to obsidian and sometimes attached to Pele's hair. The technical term is acnelis, supposedly. There are also offerings that are made to Pele to this day, such as tea leaves, as you can see on the bottom, vodka or gin, chants or hula dances in honor of Pele. Here you can see a culture practitioner praying and offering goods to Pele, and the photo beneath, tea leaves laid out in front of a house that was in the path of her destruction. So I have a, another short video here, which is a local hula halal school of hula that is bringing gifts to Pele. And in this one, we have a video capturing a mele, which is a chant to Pele during the night. And I apologize for the loud frog sounds. Hilo is known for this invasive species and thus noise. The Hawaii is steeped in traditions, veiled in mystery, myths, and legends of old gods that are still being told for the many generations to come. It's a way for the local people to remember an intrinsic aspect of the islands and a paramount component to the genetic makeup of the culture and understanding of the environment itself. It's a way to connect people to the land and maintain a sense of respect and reverence for forces, natural forces that are out of our control. Last year, a draft of TMT, which is an acronym for the 30 meter telescope, was petitioned to be built next to the other telescopes on the summit of Mauna Kea. Protesters spoke against the des desecration of sacred land, while the scientific community argued that Mauna Kea offers scientific opportunities to better observe the world beyond us. Jason Momoa, also known as Aquaman or Khal Drogo up there in the top, joined the protesters. 
I wanted to pose this modern conflict as an example to reflect upon. How is culture, and therefore sacred attributes such as land, viewed and enacted by different groups and parties, by the outsiders of the culture, as well as insiders, and whose voices are heard or held to be more valid over the other? What are the political ramifications of both parties? And what are the implications of political and or highly profiled people when they are present in cases as such? And how can we facilitate a compromise for both parties? Is that possible? And who has more to sacrifice? At the end of the day, the longevity and presence of ancient Hawaiian legends and myths acts as a testament to the power of oral traditions and the richness of culture it creates even into the modern era. Mahalo nui loa.